Hi. <clears throat> this is the Chris this is the philosophical angle. Let's do it one more time. Hi. This is the philosophical angle. Defining concepts in current media and I'm your host Chris Angle. I'm the author of four books on philosophy, one of which is The Philosophical Equations of Economics. These books are available free for viewing online at www.philosophypublishing.com. Along with me are our panelists, Mark Brennan, professor at the Stern School of Business at New York University. He is also the American editor of the Quarterly Review of London and established 1809. Rick Samuelson is also with us. He graduated from Yale, has an MBA from Wharton, an MA from Tufts. He's a retired investor from the investment banking industry. Welcome, guys. The purpose of the philosophical angle is to examine the nature of the concepts and topics being used in current media and offer an explication of their essence. Today, the topic will be QE3, part two, as we did a program a couple weeks ago. Today will be part two of that. The first one was labeled QE1, part one, a political decision because we came to the conclusion that really the Fed decision to undergo a third trial of bond buying was a political decision more so than an economic one. That is, they wanted to help the government instead of you, the consumer. This week, part two, is a statement from an article in the Wall Street Journal by John Hilsenrath entitled, How Bernanke Pulled the Fed His Way. In that article, <coughs> in paragraph one, he stated in late August, Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke argued on behalf of Fed programs to stimulate the lumbering U.S. economy and signaled that more might follow, making headlines in his highly anticipated speech at the Fed's annual retreat in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I liked his uh, expression of lumbering U.S. economy, an understatement possibly. Later on in the article in the Wall Street Journal, uh, Mr. Hilsenrath stated, Mr. Bernanke didn't see inflation as a threat, but viewed unemployment as a deeper problem than he had realized. In the next paragraph, the result of the Fed's two-day meeting that began f September 12th was an 11 to 1 vote to undertake one of the banks, one of the central bank's most ambitious stimulus programs. The Fed announced it would buy $40 billion a month of mortgage-backed securities and, for the first time, promised to keep buying until the U.S. job market substantially improved. In the next paragraph from the uh, article, quote from Bernanke, this is a Main Street policy, Mr. Bernanke said after the September meeting. What we are about here is trying to get jobs going. The bond buying aims to drive down long-term interest rates and push up the values of homes, stocks, and other financial assets. The, the officials hope their commitment will jolt households and businesses into spending, investing, and hiring. A worthy objective, no doubt. <coughs> Then later on in the article, it states, in Mr. Bernanke's view, employers weren't hiring because of weak demand for their goods and services. 
which Fed policies might help remedy? Well, there's an understatement. That's correct. We do have weak demand. So let us, let us begin and go to our, our notes by, just, by trying to understand what is demand, particularly economic demand. <clears throat> so here's our notes. We'll start with the, the idea of demand. And demand comes from the nature of, of man. Man wants all that is good to help him bring himself up away from misery. It's natural that we would want to be away from misery and go in a, the other direction and go toward good. And so it is. And that sparks our demand for those things that are good for us. It's natural. We want things that make our lives better. We want medicine that makes us healthy. We want food that makes us healthy. We want a nice house in order to be comfortable in which to live. All natural things. And of course, so we have a demand for such things. Well, that demand, our want for those things that are good, we prioritize. And then we go out and we strive to be able to achieve acquisition of those things. So we work. And we sacrifice. And we sacrifice our information and knowledge. We sacrifice our time, our effort, amidst a, an atmosphere of risk to create a reward for ourselves. And this sacrifice in the commercial marketplace would be known as a job. And we can get a job in two places. We can work for ourselves. We can go out and let's say we start building decks and we offer this service to our neighbors and, and, uh, and, to, the, uh, and to our community at large. And, and we get people to uh, give us work for building decks or, or, might, or whatever it is that we want to do. Companies also. They gather, they can give jobs to people, and they, have, they, they make services, goods and services. And they invest their knowledge, their information, their time and effort to make these goods and services. Well, no matter whether your sacrifice at work comes from, is at a company, or your doing it on your own, self-employed, you get a reward. A reward for your hard work. And from that, we get some money, which is the nature of, which is a, a part of the reward. If it's not money, it's, it's usually done on a barter system. So from money, we take it to the, we note that we have a demand for certain things that bring us up away from misery, so we take that money to a marketplace where we meet the goods and services made by companies at the marketplace and we exchange our money, which comes from, which is our reward for doing work, which comes from our, from our impetus to attain those things that are good for us. So at the marketplace, we take our demand and we exchange our work for goods and services, which are also sacrifices of a company that on the other side of the equation. So let's go. Let's go to the next chart. So how has the, the Fed facilitated the demand in the marketplace, or can it at all? The Federal Reserve Bank sees that there is a demand lacking in the U.S. economy and tries to spur it by, tries to provide some efficiency, perhaps, to be able to uh, increase demand. 
And in this time, in QE3, they are buying uh, bonds and particularly mortgage-backed securities in the hope that this will lessen interest rates, which is good. Less interest rates may increase demand because it can provide the cost of money, which will be a greater efficiency with low interest rates for the company to operate to produce a good and service. But on the other hand, adding money not backed by production, as we have here, all here in this, in this chart shows nothing else but production. If it's not backed by, by, by production, but just being created out of thin air and printed, as everybody knows who has taken an elementary economics course, the risk of inflation rises. And this may lessen demand. So let us go to our panel and discuss this possibility of whether interest rates, the lowering of interest rates, can exceed the possibility of inflation and whether this could bring a lessening of demand. So will this be overall a good thing or harmful to the U.S. economy? Guys, any uh, initial reaction? Um, I can't hear him. How can you hear him now? Can you hear me now? No. Yeah, you, you can hear me now? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to unpack Mr. Bernanke's stated argument just for a second, uh, namely his statement that they want to raise asset prices to increase demand. One of the